The National Basketball Association captured the sports headlines this week with the brouhaha in Los Angeles. On Wednesday, Lakers superstar Magic Johnson decided he was unhappy, demanded to be traded. The NBA leader in assists and the steals, averaging 17 points a game, demanded Wednesday night to be traded if Paul West had remained his coach. Well, Magic got his wish. Coach Paul Westhead was canned. Paul Westhead has been fired as the coach of the Los Angeles Lakers after the team star, Magic Johnson, said he wanted to be traded. Paul Westhead, the people said that you might have been responsible for him leaving the organization. All I asked was I want to be traded, and then all the other things came out. So, uh, I went on David Letterman, and I didn't want to continue to bash Coach Westhead. You know, I'm not that dude. I just wanted to move on. I wanted us to get back to our winning ways. I wanted us to get back to running and gunning because we were not doing that. It doesn't seem that long ago that we were winning a world championship. And I say adios to the people of Los Angeles. It was my first time being fired, but I, I learned a long time ago that if someone's going to fire you, don't beg. If that's what you want, then okay. It was going to come down to Irvin or Paul. Paul couldn't do what Irvin did on the court. <laughs> so, you know, if, if the coach can't uh, make a very, very key player happy, we're not going to win as many games as we could. And that, that, that's just a fact. In the best interest of the entire Laker organization, we have appointed Jerry West as offensive coach Pat Riley will stay as coach for the Lakers. Well, first of all, I'd like to clear up one thing. I'm going to be working for Pat Riley. And I feel that my responsibility with and for Pat Riley. And I think my responsibility is to him because I feel in my heart that he is the head coach. And hopefully my position here won't be a, a long range uh, position. Dr. Busk announced Jerry was going to be the head coach, and then Jerry came up and said, no, Pat's going to be the head coach. And then I got up there and said, well, if nobody wants it, I'll take it, <laughs> you know. Ed Arnold, who's been covering the story all day, is with the new coach, Ed and Pat Riley. Yes. Well, Pat Riley is the new coach. Actually, there are two new coaches, according to Dr. Jerry Buss, the owner of the team. One is Jerry West. The other one, of course, is Pat Riley, who's with me now. What will the status be with, between you and Jerry? Well, right now, uh, Eddie, because I'm familiar with, uh, you know, the total concept of the Laker team offensively and defensively, uh, I will be in charge. Uh, Jerry will uh, support me offensively and the suggestions and, uh, you know, in that capacity until a further date if there is one. So at the press conference, my dad is explaining that Pat would be coaching defense and Jerry would be coaching the offense. But when Jerry West came in and contradicted my dad, my dad had to defer to Jerry West, therefore making him the shot caller in the organization. I offered Jerry West the job, and I said, you may use or not use Pat Riley to whatever level you choose. And I will hold you responsible for the overall program. And in particular, I want you to improve our offense. Uh, after that, Jerry talked to Pat, the news conference was held, and he said, Pat Riley will be the head coach. You see, with the authority that I gave him, he has the right to do that. Uh, my feeling is, Jerry, you take this, and you do what you think is right and what you think is best. If that's what he thinks is best, I have every faith in him. So Pat Riley is running the ball club? Uh, that's correct. I don't think my dad was angry about it, but it definitely set a tone for their relationship going forward. You know, that's not how my dad would want to be thought of, that he wasn't the sole decision maker. Magic, if you disagree with Pat Riley as you did with Paul Westhead, would you ask to be traded? Well, we just have to wait till that comes. <laughs> I can't answer that now. How can I answer that? And I, like I said, I just wait till it comes. Your thoughts on Pat Riley? Well, uh, he's the coach now. I, he's the man I have to work for. I hope uh, that things go smoothly. Think you have any problem at all with the players? 
I don't think so. I hope not. Uh, you know, they're professionals, and, uh, you know, this day has uh, come and gone, and tomorrow night they're playing against a team that beat them by 30 points last week. So I think their incentive is, is to play, and, uh, and I don't think I'll have any problems with them. One of the things about Dr. Buss is that he wanted team to be a family. As much as we are together as a team, the only way you're ever going to win is to be a family, is really be tight and to trust one another. California love. Shot as an owner. You think he likes it? <laughs> At this moment, I can't believe it. What's the future? Want to replace your father at the top? Yeah. <laughs> Between my daughters and my sons, there's certainly enough sports teams to go around. Are you and the rest of the family, are you guys all on the same page? The Lakers caught in the middle of a family power struggle. I think I've really left them with something. My teammates didn't like that Dr. Buss and I were close. But what made life even worse than that is when he gave me the 25 year, $25 million contract. 21 year old Urban Magic Johnson has just pulled off a trick that makes Harry Houdini look like a two bit carnival act. The 6'8 guard who led the Lakers to a world championship finish his rookie season has signed a new contract. It is a whopper, folks. The two year veteran will earn about $500 per hour based on a 40 hour work week for the next 25 years. That comes out to a nice, neat little sum of $25 million. It is the richest and the longest in professional sports history. Magic came to me and said, I would like to be a Laker throughout my entire playing career. Could we sign a long term contract? I said, Yes, we can. So you have to visualize what salaries will be at that time and uh, my guess is for a star of magic's caliber at that time the price will be a million dollars so we signed him for a million dollars a year people were saying that dr bus was crazy because at that time that that kind of money going around the nba was just that yeah, was crazy every owner in every league in america was upset at my father for starting this precedent they were saying, you're about to ruin sports. What we wanted to do was work magic into the front office after the basketball days are over. He said, I'm going to explain the Laker business to you, the real business. Took me through what season ticket holders mean, the TV contract means. He just became a father figure and a mentor all at the same time. Magic and I kind of feel that our fortunes will be tied together for the foreseeable future. And then all hell broke loose. <laughs> Kareem was mad. Like, what? Wait a minute. Is he the player or is he management now? Kareem took it personally. He seemed absolutely upset. He referred to him as in the headline, I think it was a spoiled child. If this guy's worth five, 25 million for 25 years, what am I worth kind of thing? He wasn't happy about it. This was a contract that gave you everything in the state of California, <laughs> south of Ojai. Uh, now did Kareem, was it true that he went into Jerry Buss's office and said, what's the deal here? Well, he just wanted all the rest of California and Phoenix. <laughs> <laughs> I just understood it in terms of it being um, he was a key employee. You want to keep him as long as you can. <laughs> and, you know, I, I wasn't going to get jealous. Uh, they weren't going to give me 25 years. <laughs> I, they, didn't, they wouldn't want to be paying me when I was 50. The contract certainly represented their closeness. And it raised the question of, is he one of us or one of them? Whew, man. It was like nobody liked me. Don't speak to him, don't say nothing to him. Uh, we want to see what he's made of, all that, man. It's like, I didn't have a friend in the world. 
Matter of fact, they had a meeting about it. <laughs> and they came to me and said, Urban, you know, it's an unwritten rule, you can't be close with the owner. And I said, well, I don't care about no unwritten rule. I'm going to be close with Dr. Buss, and you guys can't make me stop. If we're talking in the locker room or the shower, and you know, we're talking about what players talk about off the record, is he gonna go back and report it to management? You can't go out to dinner with the owner three nights in a row and then come sit in the locker room with everybody. Well, that's what Magic did. And everybody was like this. <laughs> now, wait a minute. Now, I've never told Dr. Buzz one story about any story that I heard on, on the bus, on the plane, in the locker room, and then when we're out at a nightclub party. I've never said anything to Dr. Buss about your life, my life, my private life, never. Matter of fact, he's never asked me. Whether you were talking to the owner or not, it would be perceived that way. You know, that's a very thin line. And we walked out, I said, listen, man, I'm here to play basketball, I'm here to win. I didn't get involved in those kinds of discussions. They didn't ask me what I thought about what somebody should get paid, and so, my thing was always about, how do we keep this together? Coach Riley had been a player. He'd been in the booth. He had been around. So we all had a relationship with him. It wasn't like he was a stranger. Pat Riley came in, and he was like one of us. We'd hang out in bars after games and drink. He was just like one of the players. Well, I was with Kurt because he's an alcoholic. <laughs> <laughs> no, he wasn't. Now I'm a real coach, <laughs> okay? Here's what coaches do. They stand up and they yell and scream, and they wave their arms all over the place, and they put fingers in the air, like two up, one up, three up, whatever it is, fist up. And I can remember Magic one time looking over to me, and he just waved me off. I talked to him the next day of practice, and he said, Coach, we love you to death, man. He said, could you just sit down? <laughs> <laughs> Just sit down a little bit. He said, I got this. We got this. After talking to Magic, I sat down too much, and then I wasn't doing anything, and then we had uh, somewhat of a spell where we were losing. Dr. Buss called me in. He didn't talk about basketball or anything. He talked about his family, his background, where he's from, all this stuff. He asked about me. And then at the end, he said, Just coach. Just be a coach. You know, and don't worry about it. Don't be afraid of whatever. Go out there and coach. And now the starting lineup of the Los Angeles Lakers. The Lakers had a struggle last year. We lost our world championship. But we're going to get it back. The head coach, Pat Riley. Everybody loved him. Everybody loved the situation that he had brought to the team and the freedom that he kind of recreated. He opened up the gates again. He said, you know, we're going to run. I'm going to trust you guys. Right, right side, in deep. Bank of 10 is good. The having to ply your craft at the Forum in Los Angeles is a difficult task for any coach. After all, they're used to winners here, and it's Hollywood, so you have to put on a show. How well has Pat Riley done? Well, the record speaks for itself. We started playing happy again. We got back into our system and playing the style of play that we played in 1980. I signed as a free agent with the Lakers in 1981, and I got hurt, like, the end of December of my first year. Left side to Magic, down the middle of Cupjack. Cupjack runs over a man charging. Oh, Cupjack Cup. hurt! Joe Jellybean Ryan steps in front of me to draw a charge, and I planted my left foot to try to stop. You know, I never felt anything like that, so I knew something was really wrong, and I missed close to two years. What's it feel like to have to spend Christmas Day in the hospital? Well, it's, it's not the best possible situation for me to be in, but uh, it was a way for me to get my parents to stay out here for a couple extra days. Dr. Buss stood by me when I got injured, and only that, he hired me as a scout. Mitch Kupchak tore his knee up, and they needed another power forward type slash center, and I was out there. But on Christmas Eve 1981, Bob McAdoo was asked to sign up with the L.A. Lakers. McAdoo was the league's most valuable player in 1975, the league scoring champ three times, and he owns a career scoring average of 26.4 points per game. I had done everything individually that a player could do in the league. I needed a championship. Great defense by McAdoo from the corner. 
that power forward. There's Bob McAdoo, the former MVP, former scoring leader, and he's there for one reason, he wants a ring. And then you got Kurt Rambis, and he was just there because he wanted to play basketball. We were in Indiana. I'm a rookie, I'm not playing, I'm just hanging out, watching the game and stuff like that. And Riley points down at the end of the bench and goes, you, kind of, yeah, you, get in. And uh, I went in and, and focused on defense and rebounding, and I did a good job and ended up starting the rest of the year. Starting at forward in his first year from Santa Clara, number 31, Kurt Rambis. They've shot to the lead of the Pacific Division in just two months. The brand of basketball is exciting. Whatever the Lakers didn't do for Westhead, they're doing now for their new head coach. I'll never forget the day I said, hey, Riles, and he stopped me and he said, you gotta start calling me coach. I'm, I'm coach now. One ball, one three. We saw him transform and take on that leadership role. That's when he went with the haircuts and the suits and everything, and he started looking more like a mafia don than a basketball coach. <laughs> Riley's look was so iconic that multiple people stole it for movies. Kurt Russell steals Pat's look. Michael Douglas steals Pat's look. Before that, he looked like a hippie. And I don't mean that disrespectfully, I mean that respectfully. The money was different, he can afford suits now. You know, he was the coach of Showtime Lakers. He's been handed a championship team, and all he has to do is just get on the backs and ride it. He was like a cowboy who turned his horse loose and let him romp through the meadows. They got their game back. They got their ability to do the pass break back. They got Showtime back, and they, so they were just thrilled to play for him. 82, we were representing the Eastern Conference again. <laughs> I'm not going to say that we were overconfident, underconfident, or anything. We just know that, you know, we were trying to climb a mountain. Welcome to game one of the NBA World Championship Series, the Lakers against the 76ers. And it promises perhaps to be the fastest paced championship series of all time. Jerry, no man in the history of sports has ever purchased a franchise and reached the championship round two out of three years. Uh, that pleases me very well. Now we've just got to win it, Chick. Well, you've got the ingredients to win it. I think that you'll have to say that. In 1982, the, the Lakers and the 76ers met again, and uh, this time, I, I didn't see it as an even match. This is a lightning-fast team, maybe the best fast-break team of all time. I'm talking about the Lakers. Rambus to Nixon, over the shoulder pass to Rambus, under the well, score! It was still a tough series, it went six games, but you never had the feeling they were gonna lose. Number six, Lakers lead three games to two. All the press was Julius Serving getting a championship. And I said to myself, he'll get this over my dead body. And I meant it. He's probably very hungry <laughs> for a title, so we gave Bob McAdoo his appropriate respect. Riley just broke that thing to a championship, man. <laughs> Three, two, one. The Lakers are the world champions. Pat, Pat, congratulations. Fantastic job. I'll tell you what, Brandon. The players deserve all the credit because they're the ones that play. They trusted me early in the season, and I didn't know what I was doing, and we've come a long way. When did this team start to believe in your leadership? Well, I just think they believed in themselves. I was out there just sort of throwing a little bit. Right here. Doing it, Thank you, Brandon. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you, everybody. Congratulations. Let's the Lakers have won two of the last three, so Larry, make the presentation to Jerry Buss here in a big day. Larry, I'm going to accept this trophy on behalf of the fans of the Lakers. I know there are millions and millions and millions of fans who watch this game tonight. And wherever you are, I want you to know the team won it for you, the fans. Thank you very much.
being able to win two championships in three years is really gratifying. To see the whole city come together, Spanish language theater downtown is congratulating us in Spanish. Chinatown, all the different ethnic enclaves, they all seem to be Laker fans. L.A. is a city where, you know, as Wu-Tang would say, form like Voltron, right? I mean, so you have, like, all these different cities, different communities, different areas that are, in many ways, their own unique entity. What the Lakers do is, with their success, they're able to help create a more cohesive sense of the city. When I moved to L.A., my high school was like a third white, third black, third Latino, 10% Asian, and everyone had different music they liked. But everybody loved Earth, Wind & Fire. So the music was transcendent. And with basketball and with the Lakers, it felt the same way. Is that gave me that feeling. We wanted to put on a show. We wanted to entertain the people. We wanted it to be very indigenous to Los Angeles. And the Lakers do have the personality of Los Angeles. Oh, yeah, it's real. Don't come off. Yeah, I would figure, well, the Lakers can't win championships forever, but I can keep their memory on my own forever. You know, when you're here in L.A. and you want to entertain yourself, you'll go to a concert, you'll go to a Dodger game, you'll go to the racetracks. What he loves is that all the people that he's admired all his life, when they want to entertain themselves, they come here to the forum. Jerry Buss not only bought himself some well-known numbers, he bought some fancy company. The forum may be in Inglewood, and the team names may say Los Angeles, but some nights it's all Hollywood. Laker games were known to have celebrities. And not just a game every now and then, they were there all the time. They may have been stars in Hollywood, but for two hours, they were Laker fans, pure and simple. What'd they say? Celebrities watching celebrities. <laughs> the NBA bought into it, too, because here you are, you got a team that's in Hollywood and all these big stars at the game, and this team played this fast-paced kind of game. It fit the whole narrative. You know, what he was trying to create, his persona. He was made for it, you know? I mean, he was the ringleader. And he thoroughly enjoyed it. And we watched him enjoy it. And we enjoyed watching him enjoy it. You know what I mean? And he enjoyed watching us enjoy it. I mean, it was that kind of thing. He became this overnight celebrity. And then he created the Forum Club. I got to have a spot after the game that everybody want to get in. I'm going to create the Forum Club. He was going to games every night, so instead of saying, hey, tonight we're going out to this restaurant or out to this club, it was now at the Forum. All those people you saw on the floor, they would be in a Forum club after the game. That was the place to be. You know, I was upset when I missed it, you know? My dad would take the center table that everybody could see if they walked by, and he made sure that his table was full of celebrities. It was like the Roman Empire. Okay, you'd walk into the left, and there was a big dinner. I got so many calls from so many athletes, celebrities. Hey, you think you can talk to Dr. Buss that I can sit at his table for dinner? <laughs> We'd have curfew any other city except L.A., and for good reason. You hurry up, took a shower, and you went up the back stairways to the Forum Club. I probably did the fastest shower I've ever took. I think I got my hand wet. You walk in, and there's every color girl. There's, I mean, fine. It was not a ugly soul in the whole spot. Form Club was a magnificent place. That's the second best place on earth to be other than the Playboy Mansion. I was married at the time, so the only time I went through the Forum Club was with my wife in my hand, and I always kept my blinders on. So I was just looking straight ahead. I knew I'd hear about it. When you looked at our team back then, everybody was married, except for me and Magic. One time I was just sitting there, and a player came out of this office closet area uh, with a woman, a little disheveled, and the player said, wow, that was great. One night I'd like to be single. <laughs> 
Was cocaine all up in the forum club, to your knowledge? There was the forum club. And then there was the press lounge. The real action went on in the press lounge, to be truthful. There was a guy, and I was always very happy that he was there. Oh, well, uh, one thing I can tell you for sure, it wasn't me. <laughs> the Lakers, the Kings, the Forum, you know, the family, everything's going right. Our lives had totally changed. Selling tickets, that was just to gain the first experience. Then he would try to find a place for you that would fit your personality. He wanted to be just like the Kennedys, you know, and he wanted to see his children take over the business. And at some time in the future, I will retire, and uh, I would like to continue to operate the forum as a family business, but they're going to need experience in order to direct something the size of the forum and the Lakers and the Kings. So I want to introduce you to a 19-year-old general manager of the Los Angeles Strength, Jeannie Buss. She's the daughter of Forum Kings Lakers owner Jerry Buss. And Jeannie, you're going to be a junior at USC majoring in business administration. So let me ask you a business or finance question. How has Team Tennis gone financially this year? It's going pretty well. I stand to lose a little bit, but not as much as my dad lost in the first time with Team Tennis. Martina is playing Billie Jean. Prior to my dad buying the Lakers, he owned a team in World Team Tennis. When he asked if I wanted to run the team, I was like, of course, yes, I'm, yeah. And I said, this is great, now I can quit school. And he said, no, 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 no. <laughs> it's like, you have to go to school and you can have the job. But if you, you can't take the job and quit school. Jerry believed that you should throw people into the pool and if they can swim, they survive. And I felt sorry for them because they were thrown into things that they didn't understand. My dad called me and he says, you know, the funniest thing happened, I get a call from the MISL, which is Major Indoor Soccer League. And they want us to field a team in Los Angeles. This is son, John Buss. He's the president of the Los Angeles Lasers, an indoor soccer team. My dad said, Johnny, you take over the Lasers. You do what needs to be done. And I rarely, maybe once or twice a year, ever talk to him about the, the business of the indoor soccer league. Johnny's the oldest. And there were a lot of probably pressures that I can't relate to. My dad kind of threw him into the fire because that's the only way you're gonna learn. But what is it besides cheering that a general manager does? During the season, Jeannie's here every day, keeping track of what's happening in tennis because after all, she will want to draft the best players available, a trait she hoped runs in the family. Right after we decided that she would run the franchise, the draft came up. She brought in a sheet of paper with all of the names and said, well, let's draft the team. He looked at the list and then looked at me and he said, I want you to do it. And she said, well, I thought you'd give me some suggestions. He said, I want you to have the responsibility. I want you to know what it feels like when people say, what have you done? What have you picked? I want you to, to get the blame or to get the recognition. Let's make no mistake about it. It's your team. It's your ball game, and it's up to you. This was grooming for, you know, what he wanted us to do, and that was to be involved in a family business. It was John does the lasers, Jeannie does the strings. And so at the forum, my dad had it pretty much running like a machine, and it wasn't, I wasn't, I was part of the machine, but not an intricate part of the machine. But never did I say, well, gosh, it would be nice if I had a team or something like that, no. I could see jealousy uh, between, well, all of us. I mean, I think we were all, well, I know I was a bit jealous of Jeannie, but she's older than me, so she got the opportunity before I got a chance to, to do something. Janie's jealous of that Jeannie did this, or Jimmy's jealous of Jeannie, and Jeannie's jealous of me, and, je you know, it was that jealousy kind of thing. They might have been, um, 
you know, intimidated by my ambition, but it was more the media that I got the center stage, that I got the spotlight. I got a lot of attention because I was a woman in a traditionally, you know, male sports world. And, you know, they that probably was frustrating for them, but that I couldn't help. What's the future? What do you really want to do? Hope to replace your father at the top? Yeah. <laughs> I've already told him that. He knows that. I think um, he's kind of surpri surprised that his, his daughter would be saying that and, and really wanting to fill his shoes, but I think someday I could do it. What about the idea that there's been just too much too soon for Jeannie? Oh, uh, certainly there's that possibility. Uh, and I think any conscionable father would think of that. On the other hand, sooner or later, she's going to have to come to grips with that. That's when he said, Jeannie, I want you to meet Linda Zafrani. I was working for Playboy, and Dr. Buss was dating my little sister, who was also working for Playboy. Dr. Buss was on to the next young beauty, and my sister was devastated. So I called Dr. Buss up, and I said, I don't think it's fair what you did to Debbie, and I think you should marry her. He's like, I'm not going to marry her, but I appreciate how you stuck up for her, and I wonder, would you consider working for me? My dad said, I want you and Linda to work together. As he explained it, Linda's got that street smart toughness that I think you need. He wanted someone that he thought she could trust to help facilitate her ability to do both things, go to school and work. And even though she had older brothers, she was the front-facing person, so she had added stress. In 1982, there was another big coin flip. It was the Lakers against the Clippers. Lakers had the pick because they had traded Don Ford to Cleveland, and Cleveland finished last. What do you guys feel? Here you win the championship, you're the best team in the NBA, and you get the number one draft pick. <laughs> well, I feel that every championship team, and the reason that, that you don't repeat, because you don't get better. But this year, we'll get a little better with this first choice, and it might help us for next season. Rich get richer? Yeah, so to speak, the rich gets richer. <laughs> for the first pick, Cleveland to Los Angeles, Los Angeles. He's six feet nine, 225 pounds from North Carolina, James Worthy. Worthy helped lead the Tar Heels to the NCAA championship this past season as a junior. He chose to give up his final year of college eligibility and made himself available for the NBA draft. And you have added more excitement to a stable that is already plenty exciting. James Worthy, it didn't take you long to make that selection, Dr. Buss. Uh, it took us a lot of thought, though, uh, quite honestly, Eddie. We were very torn between the three top people. Uh, they're all so good. I mean, usually this doesn't happen. Usually there's one or two outstanding, but three outstanding players. We spent a lot of time, and I guess about a week or ten days ago, we came to the conclusion it had to be James Worthy. Now you have... Do you feel, with the success that they've already got, that you'll be able to get into that starting lineup right off the top? That's not one of my main objectives. Uh, I just want to come and, and, and learn. I think it'll be a learning experience for me. And I was a pretty good player coming out of college. And so I was not arrogant, but I was very confident. I thought I could start. The first week of training camp, I would walk into the gym, and I would look around, and I would say, OK, there's Kareem. Jamal Wilkes, Norm Nixon, there's Magic. But then I saw Kurt Rambis. Kurt Rambis had these thick glasses on, like he looked like a science professor. And I said, I can get that spot. My hair, my mustache, the glasses, it just kind of made me look like a normal person walking down the street and not the guy that was starting for the Lakers but I could not believe they were bringing somebody in to take my job. 
So I did everything I possibly could to let him know, if you're going to take my job, you, you got your work cut out for you. That first week, every time I got within his area where he operated, Kirk Rambis kicked my ass like a rag doll. <laughs> That makes me feel good right now. <laughs> that, that was my intention. So I humbly had to sit on the bench. It was a lesson in patience when you're playing with a team that really doesn't need you right now. Jerry, things are really on the uptick in the NBA, and I think the Lakers are sitting right up on top. You've got a very exciting ball club, and I see that things are going to continue. We have a tremendous amount of excitement out in Los Angeles, and I think uh, across the country. Uh, as more of the exciting players come into the NBA, I, I think there's going to be a terrific upswing. My dad always kept his eye on the business. Like he, this wasn't just a play thing, and he got lucky. You know, he wanted his team to always be competitive. The 76ers in 1983 had Dr. J, and they had Moses Malone, and they had great defenders like Bobby Jones. They were the real deal. We beat them in 80, we beat them in 82. You know, they were ready for theirs. Win, lose, or draw, you know, this doesn't define who I am. You know, basketball is what I do, not what I am. And as much as I used to tell myself that, you know, I realized that Everybody didn't think that way. <laughs> and so it was a relief, you know, in 83. When we finally got over the hump and, and, and beat them. Here he comes. We'll use up the clock. I had no one going to be the one. Injuries. The injuries killed us. It was just too much firepower. Gone. If me, James Worthy, and Norm Nixon were healthy, no way they would beat us. It wasn't our fault you were injured. <laughs> and next man up's got to do his job or whatever. So I don't, I don't think when you beat a team four straight times that they can say they were the better team. That, that doesn't make sense. That's delusional behavior. My hat's off to the victors, and uh, this is what it's all about, the winning, the losing, the struggle. Uh, it's great. I would have much rather been on the other end of this thing tonight, but I'm going to raise my glass to them, too, tonight. Buddy, you know what he said to me? He says, got those skeletons removed from the closet, huh? <laughs> I said, yeah, that. <laughs> They're gone. <laughs> Why does it seem to be impossible to repeat uh, championships in that league? Because the teams you beat get better. Yeah, yeah. Like, we beat Philly, they went out and got Moses. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, they beat us, and I don't know what might happen. We, we might get a, a good player. Or... When you do lose, there are some things that start happening. You know, you're always going to have scapegoats, and, you know, like, it was Kareem's fault, it was this one's fault, was this guy's negative in the locker room, this guy's doing this. Sometimes you make subtle changes in your team. We needed someone bigger out there. And I didn't think Norm was a great compliment to Magic Johnson. Jerry had come to me, I was laughing about it. I said, I'll never trade you. I said, that's a kiss of death like the Italians. <laughs> <laughs> I said, oh, I'm out of here now. I told my brother, I said, oh, I'm gone. <laughs> I'm originally from Inglewood, California, and been here all my life, you know, so Inglewood is home. That's where I was raised. You know, so when I get a call from Jerry West saying that we're going to make a trade for you today, I almost fell out, you know, fell out my bed. <laughs> Getting one of the best prospects in the draft, that was exciting for me. And also, the three-point line had become in vogue then, and that was his specialty when he first started out. Jerry West said, well, you know, we're going to win more championships with you than we ever would have with Norm. Magic, myself, and Norm, we were the trio. We always talked about we had the best three-guard combo in the league. So when they pulled that trade off, it hurt a lot. All three of us had a real bond out on the basketball court. And so when he got traded, you know, that was a, that was a tough moment for me. People were mad, they were incensed, and mourning. Jack Nicholson, he wore black for three games. I said to him, what the hell is this all about? He said, that's the dumbest trade I've ever seen. Well, he wears all black a lot, so 
Maybe he's always in Morgan. But I'm a fan of the Lakers, and I respect players. But these guys were my friends. And to this day, I wish they hadn't traded Norman. Jack and Lou, they were fans, and they know the game. And they knew me on a personal level. They knew me very well on a personal level. They didn't want to see me go, and they didn't like what happened. That was a difficult time. Probably the first time in my life I went home, and I said to myself, is this going to work like I hope it works? Jerry West makes this trade, brings in this unproven rookie, you know, so they had to test me. We gave him the cold shoulder. We uh, fuck with him. I didn't know then that that meant, yeah, we're going to try to kick your ass. <laughs> Every day in practice, we're going to go at you. We wanted to see if he could weather the storm. That went on for about four or five days to a week. And then I just told him, I said, listen, next one of y'all throw an elbow, I'm punching the shit out of you. I said, I'm just letting you know, I'm tired of the shit. And that was it. And they was like, OK, all right, this kid got some balls. He's tough. From that point on, me, Magic, and Coop went everywhere together. Byron, and as I call him, B, we always knew that if we were going to win the championship, he was going to play a key role. The Lakers and the Celtics. So many memories, so many golden moments. The Celtics and Bill Russell always winning when they met for the championship. For the Lakers, Jerry West always magnificent in defeat. Now we are ready to start again. How obsessed with winning did your father become in 84 and 85 during the Lakers-Celtics rivalry? <laughs> uh, he reminded me of, of any big sports fan, you know? It was the pinnacle of sports, of what sports is all about, of rivalry. To him, the rivalries were the greatest thing you could ever have in sports. The whole Boston-Laker rivalry goes back to the 60s. The period that when I was playing, the Celtics were there every year, and we had good teams, but we were just not good enough to beat them. The ball game is over. Boston Celtics are the world champions, and the Boston Celtics have won their fifth world championship. The Boston Celtics have given Bostonians something to talk about. That's it. The game is over. What a rivalry. The Boston Celtics have done it again. Another jewel in that crown. I have not been to Boston since I played as a player. The albatross, we felt, was on our back to sort of break this hex. I grew up watching the Celtics and that parquet floor. It was amazing on television. But when you get in there, it's pretty shitty. In the winter, we'd play in Boston. It seemed like the heat never worked. In the summers, the air conditioning never worked. We'd stay in the hotel, and it seemed like the alarms would go off all hours of the night. And that seemed to only happen in Boston. We got a chance to eradicate the ghosts from the past, to clear the air for Jerry West, Elgin Baylor, Wilt Chamberlain, all the times that they could never beat Boston. We got a chance to do that. We knew how important it was to beat the Lakers because of the history. In Boston, there's always a buzz, but when the Lakers came to town, it was different. I mean, our fans knew when we played the Lakers, that's the ultimate game. The bottom line is, if you're wearing the Laker uniform, you hate the Celtic uniform. And if you're wearing the Celtic uniform, you hate the Laker uniform. It's just the bottom line. Next up, North Station, Boston Cup. The stage is set. It's the Celtics and the Lakers. Game one. I remember being glued to the television watching those Lakers Celtics games. And back then had like a you know a cheap little TV about this big and just staring at it with intensity. Now Magic Johnson, the man with the ball, and he gets it quickly into Kareem, who's fouled and gets the basket. I'd say right now, the Lakers are pretty much in control of this game. Los Angeles Lakers have won in Boston, ending a nine-game playoff streak at home, and have beaten the Boston Celtics 115 to 109 to take a one-to-nothing lead in the best of seven for the NBA World Championship. We won the first game. 
The Los Angeles Lakers handed the Celtics their first home court defeat in 10 playoff games this year. We're live at Boston Garden for game number two of the NBA World Championship Series. I made some coaching blunders in the second game. I thought it really cost us. And Lakers have it with 20 seconds to go and lead the Celtics 113 to 111. Worthy will inbound to Magic Johnson. Worst comes to worst, the Celtics will have to power. There's a steal by Henderson who lays it up and in. The pass that I made was trying to get it to Byron Scott, which Gerald Henderson intercepted and laid it in, forced us to overtime. If I don't make that pass, I think we go up 2-0. And there's no way they're going to beat us. We're going back to L.A. Today, we will define the word choke. A choke is a device on a car to improve the gas and air mixture. It is also what the Los Angeles Lakers did in Boston last night. Sorry, Connie. Then the series became real. You know, became real. We went home, then beat them by 30. The game was around. The most lopsided defeat in Boston playoff history. And the Celtics looked like beaten men. What changed the tenor of that series was in game four. I can remember going in that game, it, it, it's, we always said so we got to do whatever we can do to win this basketball game because if we don't win this one, it's over. McHale is doubled. Dennis Johnson is short with it. Cooper to Kareem, to Worthy, to Ramble. He should go the distance. Oh! And now let's watch it. Cooper and the Celtics, and now the bench is empty. As Larry Bird helps Kurt Rambis up. He was decked by two Celtics and hit the floor hard. It wasn't like we was going out there trying to hurt somebody, and Kid McHale's not knowing to knock people down like that. But when it happened, I'm going, Jesus, Kevin, what was that all about? Watching the clotheslining of Rambus, it was so intense. I'm sure that, you know, there was some begrudging professional respect, like, you know, game recognizing game and all that. But it's just this, this feeling of they really hated each other. It was brutal. <laughs> And in today's game, that would have been a $50,000 fine, and he'd have been suspended for the next game. But in the rough and tumble world of the 80s of the NBA, it didn't happen. We rattled him a little bit. We were a physical team, but that one play sort of changed things. And the Boston Celtics have even this NBA World Championship Series at two games apiece. When we go back and we get buried in game five, in probably the most uncomfortable arena that you could ever be in. It had to be 120 degrees in there. It's like 91 or 92 degrees, because we didn't have air conditioning. Well, they're not used to that in L.A. I had a teammate told me, can you imagine how many people's faces would melt in here if it was 91, 92 with all the plastic surgery? <laughs> you just have to give both clubs a lot of credit for enduring a 48-minute steam bath. We lost that game, and, and we came back in game six and, and basically neatly won game six. We have a chance to do something that no other team has ever done. Go back to Boston Garden and win a world championship on that parquet floor. And, uh, and we lost in game seven. Final second. Cooper goes to three. It's over. We choked. I choked as a coach. I didn't do a good job. I mean, the most miserable I have ever been was after that seventh game. We felt we gave away a championship, and that's the summer that they came after us and called us sissies, called us fakers, called us the Hollywood softies, tragic magic, you know, whatever it was. Oh, well, they came after us, man. The Lakers, the fakers, and a bunch of sissies, and this and that. That's all part of the game, you know? Losing always set my dad off into a dark place. To be so close and to lose to the Celtics, you know, it made him that much more determined to beat them. And then we spent the whole summer thinking about it. And then that whole season in 85, we dedicated that season just to get back to the finals and hoping they were there. Whatever you do, don't look at the camera, Gary. I came in after they had lost in 84, and it was very apparent to me. The goal for this team was not to win an NBA championship. The goal was to beat the Boston Celtics to win the NBA championship. 
for a full year now, this has been the L.A. cry. Wanting Boston, but really wanting redemption. They needed to play the Celtics, and they needed to beat them for all the skeletons to come out of the closet and sort of release this curse that seemed to be hanging over their head. Oh, I hope the Lakers do it. They should do it. Why do you think they should? Because they owe it to us to do it. <laughs> Lakers, for sure. Oh, it's going to be the yes, Lakers. for sure. Yeah, you live in L.A., of course. Of course. If you lived in Boston, you wouldn't be saying that. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't live in Boston. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Lakers. Why do you say Lakers? They have the magic man, they have cream, they have everybody. Worthy is going off to the whole series. Can't nobody stick him. You know, after the Lakers lost, I was devastated. You know, I despised the Celtics, uh, you know. Larry Bird, Kevin McHale, Robert Parrish, Danny Strange, Jerry Shitsting, all of those guys, man. I hated them. Pick them out, pick them out. Okay. And go Celtics, beat LA, zoom in, man. Hit the road, Jack. Yeah, get out of here, Jack. It's the Celtics all the way. The fans in LA are phony fans. The fans here are true fans. <laughs> the fans here are more sports oriented. They're not uh, movie goers. Here to see the stars. You know, they want to see a good game. Who's gonna win it? The Celtics. Because there's no other reason why. The Celtics are the balls. I don't know if you know anything about balls and sports out there, but they're still doing that stuff. <laughs> Best fans in the world. They're behind their teams. The perception was this was the bitter cold, tough East Coast where you had to fight for everything, and LA is where all the surfers are, and the Hollywood and the glamour and the babes on every corner. I mean, it's just, it's the perception of the cities, not, not just the, the teams. Going into the finals, the Lakers were facing the Boston Celtics for the ninth time, and they had lost all of the previous eight. The Lakers are determined to break through this time, but time will tell. And we're underway. Here's Magic pushing it up. James Worthy. Oh. Air ball. in his first half, and Worthy steps on the line with something ball. I'd be very concerned if I was Pat Riley. Hike, hook shot, and that breaks the record. The Boston Celtics have set a record for the most points in one game in a championship series, and that'll do it. No contest, game one, but it's just game one. Best of seven, give it to the Boston Celtics by a wide margin. The media went crazy, we're over the hill, we're done. What a horrible performance. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, it's too old. He was run off the court by Parrish and McHale, and he looked like an old man. I mean, they really killed us. The media killed us, and deservedly so. We choked in 84, and we choked in the first game. And I had a simple, not rule, but an understanding that when we went to a game, we all went together and nobody else, no family, no friends, nobody. We all went together on the bus, and so I said, let's get on the bus at 6 o'clock. Then I looked to my right, Kareem's running towards the bus, and there's a gentleman following him, and, and I recognized that it was his father, Big Al. My dad was starting to demonstrate the uh, process of dementia. He had gotten separated from my mom. So I grabbed him, and I, I took him on the bus. He said, can my dad go to the game with me? And I said, absolutely. <laughs> the last time that I saw my father was in 1970. I was saying goodbye to them, and, and he opened the door and came out, and he said, just remember what I always taught you that, you know, someplace, you know, somewhere, sometime, you're going to have to plant your feet, stand firm, and make a point about who you are and where you came from. Just remember that, Pat. When that time comes, you do it, you know? And he just patted me on the shoulder and left. I never saw him again after that. So when I gave my final comments before we went out on the court, I started talking about dads, my dad and everybody else's dad that I knew there. And, uh, and it was a very emotional time. The last words that I said to the team we're going out tonight to plan our feet, stand firm, make a point about who we are. We're world champions and about where we came from, we come from L.A. 
Kareem bringing his father on the bus inspired me to change my speech and talk about dads. It was probably one of the greatest motivation speech to a team that you could ever give to get them ready. Where you could feel it from how he got it and how his dad got it and gave it to him. And Pat Riley gave it to us, and boy, it was perfect. When you think back to Monday, it is still hard to believe that the Celtics beat the Lakers by 34 points. But I think the thing to keep in mind is that frequently in a seven-game series, it is the second game which dictates the tempo and the mood for the remainder of the series. This was the major breakthrough moment for that team to really own their greatness, to own it with this tremendous adversity. The Celtics' only loss in their last 22 were these Lakers in game one a year ago. It's a new year, a new game. one nothing Boston leads. And the Lakers control. When you're trying to win a championship in that environment, in that stadium, with the players that they had, it wasn't easy at all. And here comes L.A. pushing it up the way you like. I knew every time I went to try to dunk, I was going to get hit. James knew it. Magic knew when he went to the hole, he was going to get hit. That was a part of the game, as far as we was concerned. Boston thought we were soft and found out we weren't. We got some players, and they'll take your head off if that's what type of game you want to play. This kind of pace when they have the big lead. Bird is fouled as he goes in, and you don't see Larry Bird often. We were a team that could play any style of basketball that you want to play, and we're still going to play our style at the end of the day. We're still going to get up and down. We're still going to be showtime. But if you want to be half-court and gritty, We'll play that way. If you want to be physical, we'll play that way. And then we're going to still get up and down the floor. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Boston Garden. We go to game number six. The Los Angeles Lakers have achieved a 3-2 to two advantage. They want to stifle the Celtics here today and be crowned the 1985 world champion. There's no way I was going to miss it. I was shooting a movie. The studio wouldn't let me fly. I had hired a seaplane to secretly pick me up, flew to Boston, and got in my seats just in time for tip-off. Unfortunately, they cut to me in the audience on the broadcast. Hey, Rob Lowe, the actor here. And the studio found out that I was there. They were not happy. Kareem control, five rebounds for Kareem. Oh, and Magic Johnson oh. finds redemption. We were tired of hearing how we were 0-8 against the Celtics. So it was just a, a big relief for all of us, you know, to finally get that monkey off our back. The Lakers are winning it. Three in six years. L.A. comes to Boston and wins the world title. We're the only team to win a, a world championship in Boston Garden other than the Celtics. After what we had gone through the year before, being called sissies and fakers, being able to come back after that and win it in Boston Garden, I'll go to my grave smiling about that. I really wanted to win it two years in a row because nobody's done it in a long time. And uh, we were good enough to beat them. Then they came in Boston and beat us in Boston. I didn't think they could ever do that. They're so uplifting when they win championships and when they beat the Celtics and did it in Boston. It's those things that suck you in forever. I feel it now, you know, I just, I just got a, a moment. God, was it fun to root against them. Oh, the best. Coach, does it make it any sweeter defeating the Celtics here at yeah. home where you lost it last year? Goddamn parquet floor on our championship rings. We're going to have a parquet floor with a diamond in the middle of it. This is what every kid who's ever picked up a basketball dreams about doing. I couldn't be happier, man. I'm the happiest guy in the world right now. We had the people back in L.A. waiting on us now. We know they're partying for us. This is great. Now the title is back in L.A. <laughs> party hard. Everybody in L.A. get party for us. So we gonna party. We're we'll party for the rest of this summer. It's time to get down. Hey, look at this. Up. <laughs> this has removed the most odious sentence in the English language. It can never again be said that the Lakers have never beaten the Celtics. <laughs> When you've tasted that winning, it's an addiction. You want to keep winning. 
and how is that going to happen? You know, my dad was determined. This was, let's keep this going. What else can we do? Bring it on. Ladies and gentlemen, the unbelievable Dr. Jerry Buss. The ego that it takes to keep winning may be what destroys the people around you.